Okay, it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecture, sponsored by Toby Bexendale. Um, Patrick M. Byrne, CEO, launched Overstock.com in 1999 with revenues of $1.8 million. In 2014, Overstock.com had revenues of $1.5 billion and net income of $8.8 million. Forbes magazine named Overstock.com the number nine best company to work for in the country for 2010, and Byrne, the CEO with the highest employee approval rating of 92%. Byrne received the 2011 Ernst & Young National Entrepreneur of the Year Award. In 2001, Byrne began World Stock Fair Trade, an Overstock.com division selling handicrafted products from artisans in developing nations. The department distinguishes itself by returning 60 to 70 percent of the proceeds to the artisans. In addition, all World Stock net profits are donated to fund philanthropic projects in several countries. World Stock and Burn have funded the building of 26 self-sustaining schools internationally that currently educate thousands of students. Burn is a classical liberal who believes that our nation's success depends on a sound educational system and a healthy capital market. Since Milton Friedman's passing in, in 2006, Burn has served as chairman of the Friedman Foundation for, the education, for Educational Choice an organization leading the national debate for school vouchers. In 2004, Byrne, as a citizen journalist, began a vigorous campaign against abusive Wall Street practices, including focusing on regulatory capture, hedge fund insider trading schemes, settlement system failures, systemic risk, and the possibility of economic warfare against the U.S. by organized crime and foreign governments. Byrne's website, deepcapture.com, has received much recognition, such as Web Blog's award Best Business Blog in 2008, Business Pundit's Best Business Investigative Journalism in 2009, and Xmark's Top Site on Corruption in the USA in 2010. Before founding Overstock.com and serving as chairman, CEO, and president, Byrne held the same three positions at Centricut, a manufacturer of consumables for industrial plasma torches and held the same three positions at Fetchheimer Brothers, a Berkshire Hathaway company, manufacturing police, firefighter, and military uniforms. And this really blows my mind. Byrne received a, a bachelor's degree in philosophy and Asian studies from Dartmouth College, a master's in philosophy from Cambridge University as a Marshall Scholar, and a doctorate in philosophy from Stanford University. He's taught at the university level and is a frequent guest lecturer discussing internet commerce, capital markets, Wall Street practices, education, leadership, and ethics. So I introduce to you, without any further ado, Patrick Byrne. Thank you, Dr. Salerno. You rock well, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and privilege, actually, to be invited to speak with you. I've, I can't tell you how many evenings I've passed going on YouTube and looking up talks that have been made here, and I'm amazed that I, that uh, it's quite an honor to be asked to address you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the, inf the influence of Austrian economics on my uh, past entrepreneurship and something I'm working on these days. Let me just check my. So first, who am I? Uh, Wired Magazine did a profile on me about a year ago saying, meet Patrick Byrne, the Bitcoin Messiah. Uh, by the way, I'm a Messiah of nothing. I'm a fellow traveler, such as we all are. Bitcoin, I'm, you'll see my commitment is really to something called the blockchain, and you'll, which is the technology underlying the Bitcoin. And it has other applications, which I think are going to be of great interest to people from the Austrian school and the scourge of Wall Street. That, guilty as charged. <laughs> I uh, will uh, mention, I'll just say one story. So I feel like I, I, fair warning, so you know who you're listening to. In January 2007, I was invited to uh, meet with a hedge fund manager, a well-known hedge fund. The, the, the back story, if you don't know anything about my fight with Wall Street, and I'm not gonna really go into it. In 2002, we went public, Overstock went public. And when you're a public company CEO, you're out there mixing it up with hedge funds, prime brokers, 
uh, regulators. And it became very clear to me the system was bent. Within a year or two, I'd I just started swimming around in it trying to figure out it, it, <clears throat> how it was working. And it was pretty easy. Actually, there's this great science fiction novel, uh, trilogy called um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Anyone ever read that anymore? It turns out that we have, it, tur it turns out that there's all these I I species on Earth that are actually extraterrestrials, and they were here studying us. And the the smartest, the, the most brilliant species of extraterrestrial there was were little were the little white lab mice. And it turns out they're the smartest beings in the universe. And what they were studying us by coming here and being our lab mice, and they would exhibit certain behaviors and then see what inferences these humans drew. And then see other behaviors. And so that, well, that's pretty much what I was doing. I didn't have any real reason to do it, but I started going out and meeting with hedge funds and swimming around these guys and going to these conferences of hedge funds, just kind of studying how, and I, ostensibly it was that they were there to ask me questions, but I really just wanted to map how it was all working. It was very clear that how dirty it was, that there was, there was, Everything you read about now, insider trading based on expert network systems and market rigging activities centered on a guy named Stephen Cohen and a, basically a constellation of about 15 hedge funds who all operated as with some degree of coordination. So I started talking about this publicly and was pretty much ridiculed for a few years until 2008. Uh, so that's why I'm the scourge of Wall Street. But I'm and some people credit me with, or blame me, depending on which side you're on, the, this great federal inv investigation that got launched into Wall Street. Eventually, pretty much everyone you saw me name 10 years ago as being the bad guys are the names that the feds, some years later, figured out, looked into and said, yeah, and, and started arresting. So, but what I'm gonna what I'm gonna show you today, I think makes that small potatoes, what we're about to do to Wall Street, is small potatoes compared to what happened uh, five years ago. So, uh, and just to calibrate us, in my view, the essence of the Austrian approach the subject is, if there's an audience I don't need to explain Austrian economics to, it's this audience. So just go through this quickly. The subjectivist theory of value, including that prices, prices drive costs, not the other way around. The, uh, which is certainly true on the internet and in our business. Uh, dynamic, it, em, an emphasis on markets as a dynamic process versus the general equilibrium theory that we're all taught in economics. They, you know, what do they call it? Heterodox economics today. Economics as action versus equilibrium. But the entrepreneur, I notice it shares, you know, entrepreneur comes from word Latin meaning undertake, discover, recognize, create. It's related to the word prehensile, to seize, recognizing opportunity for profit, and so on and so forth, rivalry, uh, an emphasis on respect for life, private property, contracts, rule of law. In fact, to me, all of Austrian economics embodies respect. That's the common denominator of these things. It's, if, uh, it's respect for the individual. If, if if value is determined by some objective or intrinsic feature of a product, uh, of an item, then that opens the door for there to be this whole theory of exploitation. If, it's, if you follow the labor theory of value, well, that leads to a theory of exploitation, and so you need a powerful state to address it, and so on and so, uh, so, on and so forth through all of these. Private property, peace, everything, that all really comes out of a respect, I think, for humans. So let me, uh, and so to me, I was just so, as soon as I understood, well, even before I knew there was a name for it, I was drawn to this kind of approach. I think I should, should mention, but go back a step and mention uh, a little bit of the history of Overstock that you might find interesting. We, we uh, I got started in 1999, and there was, that was the days, you may remember the dot-com bubble when there was stories of people dropping out of business school and on a one-page business plan going in on Sand Hill Road and raising a hundred million dollars on just a one-page business plan. Any crazy idea. Anyone could raise money during the dot-com bubble. And in that, I'm, this is the single real light bulb moment of my life, actually, I'm going to tell you. The only moment I really consider a light bulb moment. I, uh, in that environment, I, I had actually 
done a lot of work. I'd run a small company and then a larger company. I'd worked for Warren Buffett in Omaha, run a group of his companies. Uh, then I'd retired, I was teaching. And I had this idea, which was, and I'm going to describe it succinctly, but you'll get it here, that it, it came on just one very simple idea. Mainstream American retail is set up for three things, mass quantities of similar goods from a small number of suppliers. That's how the mainstream supply chain is, is optimized. But in retail, goods become available sometimes in small quantities of dissimilar goods from highly varied supplier base. And that happens because there's bankruptcies, there's canceled orders, there's late orders that can't be accepted, there's rejected orders, there's a factory makes they, they meant to make 20,000 of something and they make 21,000 of it. It's all kind of, so there's, there's these little dribs and drabs that spill out of the manufacturing and retail supply chain. And they spill out in small quantities of dissimilar goods from highly varied suppliers. And it doesn't work in the main, it doesn't work for mainstream retailers to deal in them. So there have to be these people who clean it all up and they're called jobbers. And they tend to be folks that folks like you and me never meet. They tend to be bada bing, bada boom. I know the guy who knows the guy. I'm working on this truckload of Titleist, and he's got a, you know, you're running on a street corner in Las Vegas. Hey, Louie, what's up? Hey, listen, I got, you know, a truckload of Sunbeam Waffle Makers, 217 gross, you know, retail $99, wholesale 40 sell you the whole thing. You do a take, I'll give it all to you for $10 a piece, offer good for two minutes. And that's how our, that's how our, that's how the world of jobbing runs. And I said, well, let's, Let's get a company. I bought a flea, a company that was in the flea market industry. And I said, let's, but had these sort of Louis, Tony, Vinnie jobbers at the heart of it. I said, let's, let's get this going. We'll have a dozen or so of them. We'll buy these goods. And incidentally, if you walk down the street in Brooklyn and you see all these signs, discount to you appliances, discount to you electronics, that's what's really going on behind the scene. They're cleaning up the dribs and drabs. So we started that business and it was, October 99, we launched. And then, and we were having trouble getting going and we were selling $40 a day, then $100 a day and clicking along. And then this thing happened, this wonderful thing happened called the dot-com collapse. And all these companies, oh, well, no, I should mention, I went with that model, I went with that business idea to Sand Hill Road in a day when anyone could go with a one-page business plan, $100 million to start a pet food company. Oh, yeah, well. And I went to 85 venture capitalists. And in the fall of 99, with that idea, which I thought was so obvious, and I was turned down by 85 venture capitalists. And we never got any venture capital money. And so we were clicking along, struggling, just trying to keep our head above water when this glorious thing happened, the dot-com crash. And we discovered that as all these dot-coms went bankrupt, that this supply chain that we had optimized to deal with these kinds of you know, situations worked really well on bankruptcies too. And we went in and started cleaning up bankrupt dot-coms. We ended up cleaning up, buying, and liquidating 19 dot-coms who had been funded by the same VCs who had turned me down for money. <laughs> I promise I'm much too mature to take any satisfaction from that. I, uh, uh, I was actually, when around a year or two later, ABC, Chris Cuomo, 2020, came out to do a story when they got, actually there was a whole Doonesbury series about us called MyVulture.com. If you ever saw the MyVulture.com, it was based on a guy doing just what I was doing. And, and Chris Cuomo came out from 2020 and they did a story about this kind of, these kind of funny guys in Utah who were doing this. And he asked me on television, well, how do you feel about making money off the distress of other, other businessmen? And I said, well, Mr. Buffett always taught me that the first rule of business is if you're not going to kick a man when he's down, when are you going to kick him? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, we got, that's how we got going. And we got, uh, 
and that's how we got cash flow positive, and we rocked and rolled, and the rest was history. So that, that's, that's the background on Overstock, and I applied it to a bunch of, well, I'm going to show you how I've applied the Austrian approach in some things we've done with an Overstock that I think you may find really interesting. And one of them, and for me, this was my Saul on the road to Damascus moment, actually. And I feel this way because Thomas Sowell, Thomas Sowell and I, an economist at Hoover, who's not an Austrian, but I think probably quite sympathetic to, uh, uh, you, you know, you'd find a lot of his views sympathetic. Uh, he said that his great conversion moment was reading Hayek, F.A. Hayek, 1945, American Economic Review, The Use of Knowledge in Society. And I won't read this whole, but the, yeah, maybe I, it's worth going over. This paragraph, I'll never forget. When I, this was like the scales fell from my eyes. The peculiar, and remember that this, he's talking about society, but you can apply this to a corporation as well. The peculiar character of the problem of a rational economic order is determined by the fact that the knowledge of the circumstances never exists in concentrated or integrated form, but it's dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which separate individuals possess. The economic problem of society is thus not merely how to allocate given resources. It is rather a problem of how to secure the best use of resources known to any of the members of society for whose ends, whose relative importance only those individuals know. Or to put it briefly, is a problem of the util utilization of knowledge not given to anyone in its totality. Well, you could not describe my job better running this 2,000 person company uh, the, the, than that. So two very influential books on me by Soul were Knowledge and Decisions and A Conflict of Visions. I'm just curious, who here has read A Conflict of Visions? Raise your hand. I've known a lot of people in the, in, who describe this book as really that, that their conversion experience is that book on the right. And two themes he develops is knowledge frontier. It's very Hayekian. This, his view of things is very Hayekian. He was a student of Milton Friedman's, and he's at Stanford now, but he's really a great synthesis in my mind between, I know that the, the purists among you, how you, how you, some of you feel about my great friend and teacher, Milton Friedman, but uh, Soul seems to have blended uh, the, the two. And he speaks for the knowledge frontier. The lo in, any, uh, in any situation, there's the frontier of knowledge, and there's the locus of discretion, which is you know, the, who gets to make the decision. And the farther the locus of discretion is separated from the frontier of knowledge, the more information costs you have. And some people just see the world as a place where information is cheap to, tra to, to, uh, cheap to transfer, and you can process it centrally and issue order back to the front. But if you think of information costs as being high, then you want to always try to keep a locus of discretion shifted as close as possible to the knowledge frontier. And that, so what really comes down to in people's thinking is how costly do they understand information to be to centralize and process. And as high, well, as if, as if, if you ever run a large organization, what you find out is it is much more expensive and difficult to keep it's the nature of bureaucracies. Information does not flow f freely. It's costly to centralize and process. So you will always want to be shifting the knowledge frontier. You always want to be shifting the locus of discretion to the knowledge frontier as best you can. That leads to two different visions of institutional design in society or in a corporation. Uh, what Sowell calls the unconstrained vision, which is if you think that knowledge is cheap to centralize, then in society you're going to want be more in favor of central planning, legislative law, and design systems run by experts, run by anointed, who can run things better for us than we can run on our own. That's the Dilbert vision of things. The pointy hair guy in the corner, he's got, or in a corporation, he's got all the information, he's the expert, and he's gonna issue, so he gets the information and he sends out the orders. The other, the constrained vision of society, is that knowledge is costly to centralize, and so we want to save on that cost by decentralizing decision making through markets, through the common law, which represents kind of a combined accumulated wisdom of many trials and errors uh, that 
where the better rules have survived through a Darwinian selection process. By the way, a fantastic example of that, that uh, I don't think I've seen, maybe, 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 I'm, uh, maybe uh, papers on this have been delivered a, a lot here, uh, but, a, uh, but a fantastic example of this is the takings clause. And Richard Epstein has written about this. The great, the takings clause goes back to William of Ockham. It's almost a thousand years old. And it, it embodies a certain e economic wisdom. And it comes down to us in our, in our constitution, government you know, shall not take things without depriving, without just compensation. Um, uh, that's an example of a principle that has survived through Darwinian selection. And Richard Epstein makes a case. It, it's a beautiful example if you're looking for an example in the common law of a principle that's, that would give hamlets or villages or counties that follow that principle a competitive advantage versus their, their neighbors and would help them prosper over time. You should look at the takings clause and Richard Epstein's work on that. Uh, and self-organizing systems. That, this all follows from the constrained system, so a beehive is sort of a perfect example of, of that. Um, how I've applied that in our company is, there was a book came out 10 years ago called The Wisdom of Crowds, and it was about how there's a certain class of problems in economics that surprisingly crowds do better at solving than individuals. If you put up a jar of jelly beans up here and everybody guesses how many jelly beans are in the jar, very few people's guess is close. But if you take the average of all our guesses, it tends to be better, more accurate than about 95% of the individuals. There's a whole class of problems that, uh, that have that feature. And for a crowd to be wise, there are four constraints. There has to be diversity of opinion and independence. People can't give each other orders. Decentralization of information. Everyone gets the same view of the jelly bean jar. And a way to aggregate their, their guesses. Well, the jelly bean jar, it's easy. Everyone writes on a slip of paper and so forth. But a whole class of new technologies came out just uh, a book on them came out in 09 called Enterprise 2.0. E2.0 is a new class of technologies that we adopted in our company. And I spend my time mostly these days in institutional design. It's really funny. I, there's a woman, a colleague of mine, runs the company. And I spend my time doing sort of thinking philosophically and thinking about institutional design within the company and where I get to test these theories. Uh, and Enterprise 2.0 is a set of technologies that let us harness this wisdom of crowds in our company. And it happens in many ways. But one is everybody has a dashboard when they come in, has the same, I have the same dashboard as the customer care agent. The dashboard has all this information, all the tools you use to run all these reports on what's happening, as well as widgets and announcements and widgets about traffic and weather and stuff in Salt Lake, which is where our company is. But uh, and also, so we all share the same dashboard, and then there are a bunch of tools that I'm always pushing questions and decisions out to the crowd. And you would be amazed at how much I'm now able to push out to the company. Uh, it's made such a difference in the last five years in terms of our ability to innovate. One of them is called idea management. This came out of some work at Stanford, some sociologists and, and anthropologists and economists studied how do ideas float up in a good organization. Well, how they float up is, uh, well, there's idea management, decision management, project management. Idea management and healthy organizations, ideas get proposed. Some of them attract a certain amount of buzz. Of those buzz, some actually get buy-in. And then of the buy-in, the top, the, the executives or whatever, select some of them to do. But we built, there were some early commercial steps made towards doing this and none of the packages out there were very good is what we found. So we built our own. And we now have a system on this, on this dashboard where it's like a suggestion box, but much more than a suggestion box. People can propose business ideas and plans. Other people come and edit them and adopt them. 
and vote on them. And the system measures how much buzz an idea is getting and then how much, and people can vote up and down and they can vote with different degrees and such. And so eventually the better ideas start emerging from the muck. And all that I have to do is myself and about you know, 60 colleagues at the, you know, the leadership team, just we have a, con a continuous stream of these ideas coming out. And it isn't, like I say, it isn't just a suggestion box. It's much more powerful than that. These ideas come out, they're well-formed, very well-developed. People have been collaborating and building them together. And it's made my job so much easier because I'm not, I'm not, it's, I think that for the first 10 years of the company, the truth is I was the source of most of the ideas. And I was trying to, you know, it's just too much to stay up on. It's too much. You're the Dilbert manager in the corner. If you think you can have all the ideas to drive a billion dollar business. So I get this kick back now and there's just this continuous stream of great ideas maybe one in 50 that get first proposed actually get through this process. And what they, when they come out, they've had a lot of collaboration together and they get better and better formed. And it's just, it's, a, it's remarkable. It's changed the nature of our company. And then decision management. And this is based on the work of Kenneth Arrow at Stanford, another fellow. So I've, I'm, you know, we can view the, hierarchy is those who believe in general equilibrium. And, and then of those, there are the Keynesians who think that general equilibrium, equilibrium is full of market failures and it needs government to fix them. And then there are those who think that they're not full of failures. But, uh, uh, and uh, I, I very, anyway, Ken Arrow is one of the two big I think Ken Arrow and DeBru were the guys who came up with general equilibrium theory. Any economists? No. Anyway, so Ken Arrow, Ken Arrow was one friend, and Milton Friedman was another friend. And uh, but so, and I had great, great benefit in my friendship with these two men in, in my life. Ken Arrow, who was one of the founders of general equilibrium theory, also when he was 24 in an afternoon did a proof called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem that came out in a book called, for which he won the Nobel Prize, uh, which he came, came out in a book called Social Choice and Individual Values. And it's about, it's sort of the logic of how you can combine, in how you can combine, well, I'll put it this way. We used to meet once a year, the executive class of our company, and Everybody has a whole bunch of different projects and priorities. And so we'd get them all together. There'd be a list to say 50. And we'd get in a room like this. We'd handle and swap and log roll. And you've got your list of 40 in the order you think we should do them. And someone else has their 40 and so forth. And we would just argue and fight until we ended up with a list and never really made anybody happy. But what we built is a system that everyone can rank. You, you're 40, you rank your 40 one way, you rank your 40 another way, you rank your 40. They all get ranked, and they get fed into a black box, we push a button, and out gets the social ranking. And just like the case of the jelly beans, I am shocked at how intelligent the social choice is. And it represents, it's a very Hayekian notion we have found a way to liberate this wisdom that is scattered throughout the crowd, but that no one person has. And the list that comes out from doing this, and we do this all the time now, and the list that comes out is, uh, it's, it's become such a key part of the way we run, run the company. Uh, we have ordinal, uh, one system that uses ordinal, we built a more complicated system now that uses cardinal information. Uh, we'd use this for our strategic project prioritization and then project management. I'll kind of skip over it. There's lots of systems that do that, but, but there's a couple approaches. There's an approach to software development that again, I think uh, every time I talk about this or see us work this way, I think of Hayek. It's called agile development, agile development, as opposed to waterfall development, which is when you have a, what if, if you work with software developers in most companies for most of a few decades that it's been going on, it's really a very a process that's kind of central planning. The user writes up his requirements, they get thrown over the wall into a temple, 
the developers are sitting in the temple, they plug away, they someday they throw something back over, it's never what you ask for. You throw, all that's been eliminated in a system called Agile, uh, where uh, Agile, well, I won't go into the principles, but it's a very Hayekian approach, and we use swarms. We come up with projects where people swarm in, and again, I say Hayekian in the sense of it, it, it gets rid of the notion that there's experts somewhere who are telling peons what to do. It's recognizing that the knowledge, the real knowledge of how to get things done is embedded across a whole society, so to speak. And what you need to do is find ways to organize and find technologies that permit them to collaborate and get rid of the notion of that there's a that that your company has a Dilbert or numerous Dilberts who can give instructions to others, and these have revolutionized our company. Uh, I view it as I mean, if you think of the ways a a, a society could be organized: authoritarian, aristocratic, constitutional monarchy, republic, and democracy. Most corporations are authoritarian. There is a Dilbert in the corner making the decisions. Uh, we are pretty much a constitutional monarchy at this point. You'd be surprised how many... So, for example, we knew at the end of last year we could... Our payroll was, say, $80 million, and we wanted to give a $4 million raise. We let everybody propose, how do you want the money? How do you want the $4 million? And some people said, well, I want daycare. And somebody else says, I want... Uh, we wish we had better 401k matching. We had 50% matching, we'd like it to be 100. Somebody else says we want more time off. So all we had accountants go and price through each policy change, how much would it cost the company, and then we just put it up to a vote. And we let everybody do all, use all these tools to vote, and they selected, and they, and it, so then we ended up with a social order of what they wanted, and we just counted down the price till we got to four million, boom, and that's how they got their four million dollars. But even more than that, the strategic direction of the company is more and more being set through these methods. And I have to say, it's better than letting the executives set it. It's especially better than letting me set the strategic priority. Uh, what by liberating this knowledge that is spread through the company, it turns out the customer service agents, you know, they're the ones who understand, hey, why is it that we're not taking Canadian credit cards? And they're the ones who have to deal with the Canadian customers, and we're having to. Uh, and and they have a, they have. They're on the knowledge frontier. I'm not in the knowledge frontier. I'm not on the knowledge frontier. So, uh, this, this approach. I hope someday to be a workers' republic. I don't think we'll ever be a workers' democracy. What I have learned is, I mean, there is a reason that Greeks. Direct democracy has problems. One year, Athens is declaring a war on Sparta. The next year, they want to surrender to Sparta. You have to have some balancing, some balancing, mediating thing. So I hope to get us to be a, a workers' republic uh, over the next few years. Uh, now I'm going to go into the big things we're doing. The, uh, the Caitlin Long in the back is quite familiar with. We think we're doing something quite disruptive that we're building something quite disruptive. And I'll start with, there's a conservative writer, he's out at Hoover, Francis Fukuyama, who wrote a book about, uh, called Trust, that says that the reason, and this was written in the mid-90s, and it was the reason Germany and Japan and the United States do so much better than companies like Italy and China, is that in, it's a question of trust. And in a place like China, you can't, there aren't central institutions that are trustworthy. You only trust people in your own family. And so economic enterprises can't get bigger than, I'm told there's some, okay, great. Can't get bigger than really one big family can run. And Italy kind of runs the same way, and the same way. And the theory, Fukuyama said, was that that, that handcuffs uh, the size of enterprises and hence the, uh, the efficiency and the ability of the economy to grow. What's left out of his analysis, and, but what's left out of his analysis is the problem of centralized institutions. And the problem of centralized institutions is they get captured. Regulatory capture is much more a feature of the political process. Regulatory capture came out in 1972, I think. A friend of Milton Friedman's, George Stigler, wrote about this. I think that may have, it's the first 
formal description of which I'm aware. Uh, but it's the tendency, we, to, we set up regulators to protect us from certain industries, not remembering that those regulators have a tendency to become captured by those industries and turned against us, the SEC being but one example that comes to mind. Uh, and there's even the possibility of deep capture, which is that they capture not just the regulator, but the political process and the journalists and even academics. Uh, I have a website called, which Dr. Solano mentioned, deepcapture.com, which investigates this in the U.S. and has won all kinds of awards for investigation of corruption in the United States. Um, the problem with captured centralized institutions is that they generate the, what uh, John Kenneth Galbraith called the bezel. And I'm reminded of somebody once said, all great economists are tall with the exception of Milton Friedman and John Kenneth Galbraith, <laughs> which the economists will get here. <laughs> Galbraith was a terrible economist, but he did have this, the, uh, and he, he did have a, he, uh, uh, his idea of the bezel was that at any given point, if you could freeze time and ask everybody what they had in the financial system and add it up, you would get this. And you look at what's actually there, and there's only this much there. And the difference is the bezel. It is the amount that has been embezzled from society and has accumulated the bezel. Well, I became a believer about a decade ago that there's quite a bezel built into our financial system. Uh, the essence of the crypto revolution is that it can solve that problem. In fact, one way to think of it is for 6,000 years of recorded human history, we've always faced a choice. Do we want, when we have our consensual exchange, do we want to go peer to peer or in which case trust becomes a factor? Can I trust you? I'm trading you this camel for this gold coin. How do I know you've debased have you debased the gold coin or not debased the gold coin? Uh, so there's, we can go that way or we can have a centralized institution. Somebody, there's a business model, somebody who has the monopoly on force and this oasis has gold coins minted, stamps his face on them, and then if anyone debases that, kills them. That's a way of, that's a business model of monetizing your monopoly on force in a situation. That's one business model, that's one way to do it. What the crypto revolution lets us do for the first time in human history is go back, get away from central institutions and go back to peer-to-peer -peer exchange that is trustworthy. Fortunately or unfortunately, there are a lot of social and political institutions which have as their business model now what I just described, and this is going to disrupt them. So I think that this is, unlike Al Gore, I was not around quite for the beginning of the internet, but I, I was here a few years after the beginning of the internet, and we had an idea we were doing something as big as the Gutenberg Bible. I think the crypto revolution is going to be more significant than that because of the accumulation of our centralized institutions, which in one way or another are in the business of, since you can't trust each other, you need us. And crypto, and so you have to, you can't have peer-to-peer, -peer, you have to have a central institution. Well, we, we're gonna turn them into a buggy whip manufacturers. We don't need those centralized institutions anymore. I'm gonna give you a few examples. Well, there's of course central banking, uh, the central counterparty clearing system, which I'll be going into. Uh, here's uh, uh, another. In development economics, there's a, uh, well, long education summarize, I'll even skip this. I used to study development economics and decided it was much simpler than people made it out to be. It's not done from the top down, it's done from the bottom up, grassroots, Funds are fungible. In other words, there's a whole lot of money sloshing around in the world of development theory, and there's so much graft. And it's about women. If you want to, if you want to help the world, it's about women. If you, uh, uh, I remember reading papers on an experiment done in India, where you take a village and you take the uh, a very good way to measure increase in well-being in a family is you look at the weight of children in a family. And you take one village, you give money to men, and you look for an increase in the weight of children. And the truth is you get nothing. You get no, you increase the male income, you get nothing. 
but as this economist put it, three things, an increase in consumption of alcohol, tobacco, and hookers. <laughs> and <laughs> I said that to Buffett once, and he said, yeah, yeah, and the rest of it, they waste. <laughs> but as a joke, Buffett is a very square, teetotaler guy. But anyway, you take an identical village, you increase the income of, me of women, and you immediately get this increase in the weight of children. They've, women bank calories in their children, and the same experiment's been done in Africa and South America and such. It's development's all about women. But there's a missing foundation. So an economist from Peru, Hernando de Soto, who for years argued, Mystery of Capital is his big book, that in the West there's a bell jar. Some people live within the bell jar of formal legal rights. Uh, and they include rights to private property. Uh, and with title to property, an entrepreneur can uh, you can have an incentive to improve your property. To You can pledge it to a bank and raise capital. Uh, you can ex use the capital to expand your business. However, much of the economic activity in the world goes on outside that bell jar. And there isn't an access to, and he documents in, in Haiti and Peru and stuff, you know, in Haiti to get, you may have lived for three generations on a piece of land and built your home and your grandfather, great-grandfather built the home and you've added on, and you don't know. You don't, if you, someday the local generalissimo can show up and say, oh, senor, you don't understand, that's our property, and, and you never know. Uh, and if you try to get property, it might take you 35 years and 400 steps, 400 stamps from petty bureaucrats along the way. And every one of those petty bureaucrats wants a payoff. Uh, that, uh, so in that kind of a world, there is no incentive to improve your land. There's or less incentive to improve your land. And you certainly can't pledge it to a bank to raise capital. Expansion is thwarted. The capital is dead. He argues that there's, if you had good land titling systems around the world, it would create far, far, hundreds of times more capital would be liberated in the developing world than has ever been uh, transferred to the developing world through Western aid. That it's all there. That all we need to do is create land titling systems. Well, the implication for crypto, it is, it is possible. So by crypto, I mean the blockchain. If you've heard of Bitcoin, which I assume everyone's heard of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is just one application of a new technology that, are, that arose, was described six years ago. It's based on the mathematics of cryptography. And it's basically, it, just think, it, it call it the blockchain. The blockchain you can apply towards currency and you get a, a cryptocurrency, that's Bitcoin, but you can apply it. To, I recently was out in Silicon Valley at a company that's working through this, and they have a list of 180 things that the blockchain can be applied towards, and that they're just, they think they're just gonna step through and come up with a crypto alternative to each. It's possible to develop a land titling system that would be robust, incapable of, of being cheated, uh, and everything would occur within the blockchain. Why that's, uh, and who's working on this now, no one that I can find, close as I can find is Kate and I know some people who are working on smart contracts, which would be sort of a step towards this. Uh, but the really big idea is combining, finance, is combining financial capital with human capital, which is to say Wall Street. We can, replace, we can replace a lot of the functions of Wall Street, or a significant amount of what's done on Wall Street can be moved into the world of crypto. And I'm going to have to go through uh, why this is important and why it's possible. First, you probably all know the efficient market hypothesis, even if I hope no one here agrees with it. But in the efficient market hypothesis, every, every security has, a, has an intrinsic value. And over time, you know, its price is fluctuating around. Uh, and you can imagine under one regulatory regime, there's uh, that much noise, that much fluctuation. Under a different regulatory regime, there's that much fluctuation. And if you add up all the area under the, in yellow, you, and you add up all the area in green, the area in green is less than yellow, meaning that there's less noise in the system, so regulatory regime B is considered to be more efficient. That's the dominant paradigm of our regulators these days. That's their paradigm. However, and in that paradigm, it is not possible to rig the market. 
You can't manipulate the market any more than a uh, any more than people at a horse track who are up playing games in the betting parlor. And I suppose they had some technique in the betting. That, of course, doesn't affect the underlying horse race. That follows from efficient market hypothesis. Turns out it's not true. And I'd like to show you what this is supposed to be. Uh, this is that scene in The Matrix. Remember when Neo says you can, or Morpheus says you can have the red pill or the blue pill, and you take the blue pill, you wake up in bed, believe it, and then you want to believe it with the red pill. I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a massive scheme. There has been, market manipulation has become a regular feature of our markets. And to give you just one example, if you haven't been reading the papers and reading about the LIBOR scandal and the foreign exchange scandal and the benchmark rigging scandal and so on and naked shorting, et cetera, one of my favorite examples is these are two lawyers, Bill Arak and Marvin Melvin Weiss. They ran a law firm called Milberg Weiss that in 2000, they were the originators of the plaintiff strike class action suit. These suits you hear about where a stock, share of stock goes down and a law firm files a suit and uh, against the company on behalf of all these plaintiffs. Well, it turns out that they were using shill plaintiffs and the DOJ indictment from 2006 refers to these, and you can't, and the US law firms can't, you can't pay people to be shills. Well, the, the law firm, uh, the DOJ indictment on page 29 says, the played plaintiffs purchased securities at issue anticipating the securities would decline in value in order to position themselves to be named plaintiffs in security class fraud class actions. Well, there's something very odd about that sentence. If you think about it for a minute. The paid plaintiffs, those are the shills. They purchased securities anticipating the securities would decline in value. How'd they know? Turns out these people were being directed to go out and buy, buy stock in certain companies weeks or a month before suddenly they melted down and these lawsuits could be followed. How'd they know? If the market's efficient, you could never have done that. And these guys, Bill Arak and Marvin Weiss, you know, they, they're not stock investors, but they were able to send people to specific companies ahead of time, weeks or a month ahead of time, and buy their stock. And then, what do you know, the stock melts down and they could file their lawsuits because they were part of they, These guys went to jail, the law firm, it was the eighth largest law firm in America, it melted down. Greenspan, in October 2008, when everything was melting down and he testified to Congress, and they said, what's going on here? He explained to them this thing that, uh, that the left has jumped on this quote from Greenspan. The left jumped on it to say, oh, look, Greenspan shows that markets don't work. There are additional regulatory changes that this breakdown of the central pillar of competitive markets requires in order to return to stability, particularly in the areas of fraud, settlement, and securitization. The real problems were particularly in the areas of fraud, say Bernie Madoff, securitization, that's mortgage-backed securities, but settlement. Settlement is this really important issue, and there's someone here, Caitlin Long, who knows an awful lot about this, about settlement. It's dull as dishwater, but I hope you'll stick with me for five minutes, because first, who here owns any stock in any publicly traded company in America? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Every single one of you with your hand up is incorrect. None of you own any stock. It's not how the system works. How the system works is, suppose you've got grandma buying some stock from a hedge fund, who I represent as Gordon Gecko. You think it works like this. <laughs> Money and stock change hand. That's called settlement. But in fact, of course, we know that they don't speak to each other directly. Oh, well, the systems are divorced in the US by which the system by which money changes hands and stock changes hands. They each are represented by brokers. And we think, well, the money and the stock goes between accounts between them. That's not even really how it works. All the broker dealers in America are plumbed into a central organization you've never heard of called the DTCC. And the DTCC is is where the money and stock changes hands. But the truth is, it's not even that simple. What's going on is it's all within the DTCC, and it just changes hands and accounts within the DTCC. And in fact, it's even one step more removed from that, 
which is there's a company, a subsidiary of the DTCC, which owns all the stock in America. Nobody owns any stock, but this company, it's called CD and Company. This was all set up in 1973 because there was a paperwork crisis on Wall Street. And it owns all the stock. And then it issues, it issues contractual rights, IOUs to that stock. And so when you, when you have a broker telling you you own 100 shares of IBM, what you really have, if you read your broker statement, the fine print, you have a claim, you have a contractual right to some, you have a contractual right to a contractual right to a contractual right to a company that actually has the property rights. We laugh at the Soviet Union for having tried to run a society without property rights. How could you possibly do that? <laughs> but in our society, our property rights have, have been turned into this system in the last 40 years. And they've become, our property rights have been sliced, diced, circumcised, hypothet digitized, hypothecated, rehypothecated, and the systems are losing track of who owns what. And this shows up, this is the common denominator of a number of the scandals you've heard about in the last seven years. It comes back to the systems are losing track of who owns what. Uh, I'll skip the wh why that happened. There is fault tolerance in the system, and some criminals have figured out how to abuse the fault tolerance to play certain games. Uh, why it matters is you as Austrians will recognize this. this. This is one paradigm of how securities get priced. Here's another paradigm. As there's supply, demand, they meet, there's a price. If someone can show up and using this fault tolerance create apparent supply in the marketplace, they can shift a supply curve. And if they can do it enough, and especially against a financial company, there's ways of breaking the back of a financial stock. This is part of what happened in 2008. And everybody was saying from 2005 to 2008, I had you know, a lot of people saying I was crazy. New York Post used to run photos of me with UFOs coming out of my head because I was saying, look, there's this stuff going on, you don't understand. And then in 2008, when everything started melting down, the SEC went and did exactly what I'd been telling them they needed to do for four years. Uh, it's now become quite a problem. The Economist is writing about it. It's actually, I think that they, I think that in the last two years, uh, settlement failures have finally been addressed because it's a national security issue. Finally, some people in the national security establishment have gotten that it's a national security issue, and you can't count on the SEC, which in my view, the SEC is just towboys for Wall Street. They're not, they're not up to the game. Uh, by the way, that's why the, these guys were part of the ring of criminals who were taking advantage of this, and because they're part of the ring, they, that's how they knew a month ahead of time, or two months ahead of time, what companies to set their show plaintiffs up in front of. So how can this all, uh, oh, I started taking all this data and economists and insiders and people who are really inside baseball kind of guys into explain this on Wall Street. And I went, I'm reminded of a line of Bertrand Russell. There's a story that Bertrand Russell was once in India teaching uh, Einstein's relativity or something. And somebody, a Hindu, stood up in the back and said, I'm sorry, Professor Russell, you have it all wrong. The universe rides on the back of a turtle. And Russell said, okay, well, what's the turtle ride on? And the Hindu cosmology professor said, the back of another turtle. And Russell said, okay, well, what's that turtle ride on? And the guy said, I'm sorry, professor, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> I started bringing this kinds of information with hard data and respected economists explaining this to the NASD, FINRA, <laughs> the SEC, the US House Banking Services, Senate Financial Services, the New York Press Corps, et cetera, et cetera. And what I discovered is our establishment was turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> up until 2008, up until 2008, I was just laughed. After 2008, I got a lot of attention and there were a lot of changes and all kinds of actions brought. And it's kind of funny, because I'll, I'll look at some actions brought against people, and they'll include whole paragraphs out of papers I wrote eight years ago explaining to some law enforcement people exactly how a certain thing is being done. And you know, five years later, there's somebody you know, arrested, and there's whole paragraphs out of stuff I wrote that are, that are used in, in their indictments. So I'm happy about that. Um, here's a recent. You may have heard, who here has heard of the book Flash Boys? 
Flash Boys, this recent Michael Lewis book about the flash trading on Wall Street. This is how much actual trading, how much volume there is on Wall Street over the last 10-ish years. Now, here's how many quotes there are on Wall Street. The difference, this is all the flash trading. This, this, this doesn't represent any actual activity. This is all front running. People are front running your orders. This is, this is nuclear powered front running. 90% of the volume now in the market is front running of orders by these computers that are talking back and forth to each other 10,000 times a second. Uh, so I don't think this is good. Warren Buffett referred to this recently. See, the regulators like liquidity because under the efficient market hypothesis, the more liquidity there is, the more selling back and forth there is, the more those curves get squeezed down to the intrinsic value. So any liquidity is good. But Buffett recently said, this isn't liquidity, this is volume. It doesn't really add anything to the marketplace, but it's become 90% of the market. In fact, there was a recent Journal of Finance article that showed the US markets got saturated with liquidity, beyond which no liquidity has actually helped in pricing sometime in the late 60s. So all this stuff, Paul Volcker said back during the crash that the last financial innovation that actually added value to society was the ATM machine. Nothing else you've heard about since then. All these fancy complex derivatives and everything, they don't really add any value to society. Uh, so the current system, and I'm drawing to the end, Wall Street has centralized settlement, high frequency trading, and its current regulatory environment. Uh, the shortcomings of these are the centralized settlement is easy to manipulate and the bad guys have figured out how to do it. High frequency trading is just a to nuclear powered front running, and our regulatory environment has been deeply captured. So the simplest solution is to take Wall Street as we know it and drag it behind the barn and kill it with an ax. <laughs> it, cannot, it cannot be fixed, nor does it need to be fixed. Instead, we can move this to the blockchain. And in the blockchain, uh, the virtues of blockchain would be it's peer-to-peer -peer settlement, no centralized settlement, no manipulation. Egalitarian instead of front-running, and most importantly, there's nothing to capture. It's consensus-based. It's stateless. Now, we have to get the permission of the state to turn it on, but we're building this, and it's nearly built, and when it gets built, we'll be turning it on, and it's stateless, and there's nothing to capture. And this is what trading would look like. It would be a Bitcoin or blockchain trading would, be, would look like this. It's peer-to-peer, -peer based in the blockchain. There's no DTCC to capture. There's no, uh, none of the games, there's no flash trading. None of the games that are being played in Wall Street now could be played. So this is my <coughs> next big ambition. And I hope you see as a consistent theme through this, through this how much of my entrepreneurial activities and drives have actually been informed by the things I've learned over the years from Austria, studying Austrian economics. So thank you very much.